I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christina, you are on the front lines in the fight for the unborn, and this is really a personal thing for you, isn't it? Tell us your story. Yes, it is so personal. I found out in my 20s when I was in college that my mom had once scheduled to abort me. She was actually in the hospital with a white gown on, paid for the abortion, and a janitor saw her crying in the hallway and said, do you want to have this baby? My mother said yes, and the janitor said, God will give you the strength to have your child. My mom walked into the waiting room trying to get her stuff to leave, but the abortion doctor saw her. He called her into his office. There was blood on the floor from the last abortion, and she told him, I've changed my mind. I want to keep my baby. He said, no. He said, you've already paid for this. You're just nervous. You're going to get through it. And when she insisted on leaving, he yelled at her and screamed, don't leave this room. She ran out, and she never had any intention of telling me about that whole experience. But I was in college and I was attending a church and someone approached me and said, Christina, God wants you to know something remarkable happened around the time of your birth. And so I asked my mom if something remarkable had happened. She didn't want to talk about it. She only said that she'd met an angel before I was born and didn't want to talk about it. But eventually she opened up and said, yes, before you were born, I was going to abort you. But I met a janitor and I ended up walking out. That whole story changed my life. Yeah, rightly so. Wow, that's incredible. That gave me chills. What a wonderful testimony. And talk about a divine appointment, you know, for that yes. janitor to be right there at the right time to talk to your mom. Hebrews 13.2 Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. We find instances in the Bible when angels were sent to deliver specific messages from God. They often began their messages with phrases like, Do not be afraid or do not fear. We don't know how many times angels have been working behind the scenes, how many times they have delivered us, helped us out of tight situations, or intervened on our behalf. Angels are all around us, taking care of us and ministering to us, even when we are not aware of their presence. This certainly gives hope in these troubled, dangerous times in which we are living. When we think of all the violence and chaos and danger in the world today, it is comforting to know that God's angels are watching out for us. When you learned of your near miss with abortion, how did it influence your life moving forward? I cried when I first found out, and honestly, I didn't know what to do with my story because I come from a very pro-abortion state, the state of Connecticut. I never heard abortion talked about in church growing up. I never heard it talked about in my family. I wasn't aware of the larger pro-life movement, so I just prayed. And God spoke to me and said, Christina, I wanted you. And then he asked me a question, which was, how do you think I feel about the others? And I didn't know. I didn't know that there were thousands of babies that were dying every day from abortion. I didn't know the history of Planned Parenthood. But I researched it, and I talked to women, and I decided that I would give my whole life to that cause. And I'm 40 now, and I started when I was in my early 20s. And ever since that moment, I have fought for the ending of abortion. I have fought to save lives. I have worked at pregnancy centers. I have worked in political ways. I work right now for live action as a news correspondent. When I found that story out, I never looked back. That's awesome. Well, what results have you seen when you tell people who are pro-choice your story? I've seen a lot of mixed results. Of course, some people, their hearts are hardened. And so they'll say things like, well, I'm glad your mom had a choice, which is a very strange thing to say because you're really saying, you're glad my mom had the choice to kill me. That's a very strange thing to say to someone. But a lot of other times I will find that people's hearts are softened 
that they are moved by my story. They want to hear more. They are personally touched by it. I have seen babies saved. I have seen women choose life. I have seen women choose adoption through conversation with them. So I've seen a lot of different results, but mostly hopeful, mostly encouraging. I think people really respond well to personal stories. What is your heart for women struggling with whether to have an abortion or maybe they have had one and they regretted it? I want women who are struggling with abortion to know that they are not alone, that there's hope, that there's help available. There are thousands of pregnancy resource centers all across the country. You can call them, call one in your community. They will offer you free resources, support, and prayer. There are Christian ministries and churches that are willing to be there for you. You should never feel that you have to have an abortion because society or the pressures from family or friends or even your partner are telling you that this is your only choice. Adoption is a beautiful option and parenting is also a beautiful option with support and help. And if you've had an abortion and you're struggling and you're living with shame or guilt, I want you to know that the Lord is merciful, that he forgives and that there are resources and support available to you as well. Whether you're a woman or a man, there are post-abortion healing groups and support groups, some run by pregnancy centers and some run by churches. There's books that you can read online, and there's different ministries that are dedicated, like Support After Abortion, to helping you receive the healing that you need. Wonderfully said, Christina, and thank you so much for your courage and coming forward and sharing your story. I know that God is using it all around the world. He definitely had a plan when he sent that janitor to talk to your mom. That's wonderful. Thank you so much again. We appreciate your time. Where do angels fit into the end times? What place do these heavenly beings have in the unfolding drama in the last days? Where do we find these angels as we await the glorious return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Angels worship God in the end times as we read in Revelation 5, 11 and 12. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and riches and wisdom, and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Angels have been worshiping God since they were created, and will continue this ministry for eternity along with all believers in God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Angels hold back God's winds of judgment, as we read in Revelation 7, 1 through 3. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Angels sound the trumpets of judgment, as we read in Revelation 8.2. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. The seven trumpets declare the Lord's final intervention, bringing judgment on the earth. Angels wage spiritual warfare in heaven, as we read in Revelation 12.7-9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Angels are mighty, and they go to war for us. And lastly, an angel preaches the gospel, as we read in Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. Many Christians believe the church must preach the gospel of the kingdom in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This is not so. In the very last days, the angels will finish preaching the gospel and then the end will come. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, 
The pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. Jesus, speaking to his disciples about the signs of his coming and the end of the age, declares this in Matthew 24, 12. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. The Bible tells us lawlessness is the violation of God's commandments, as we read in 1 John 3, 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Sin will be so rampant and so commonplace in the last days that the love people once had for one another, for many, will be non-existent. In this prophecy, Jesus Christ is describing an ongoing breakdown in the relationship with God. And since people's love for God is waning, it will be evident in the way people treat one another as well. A symptom may be that the love toward other people is decreasing, but the real cause is that the relationship with God is cooling off. This is what we are witnessing in our world today. Nashville police are praising a local pastor this morning for stopping a man who pulled out a gun during a Sunday service. Surveillance video shows the 26-year-old suspect with the gun in his hand Walking up to the altar, he apparently told everyone to get up and pointed the weapon at the congregation. And that's when the pastor tackled the suspect oh. before he was able to fire that gun. Church members held the suspect on the ground until police arrived. He faces 15, 15 counts of, of felony aggravated assault. Multiple police sources tell me so far they have linked Perez Reed, who's from Bell Fountain Neighbors, to six homicides and several shootings that happened in September and October. The first happened in North St. Louis County on September 13th, when 16-year-old Marne Haynes was found shot to death. Three days later, St. Louis police found 40-year-old Pamela Abercrombie dying from a gunshot wound in the 3800 block of West Florissant Avenue. Three days after that, on September 19th, police found 24-year-old Casey Ross dead from a gunshot wound on a vacant lot. The I-team has learned the September 26th murder of 40-year-old Lester Robinson in Ferguson was also connected to this killer. Police sources tell me Reed used the same gun, a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson pistol, in all of the killings. Then, sometime in late October, a man and a woman were shot to death inside separate apartments in a high-rise complex in Kansas City, Kansas. As for how the case came together, sources tell me police tracked Reed's cell phone to an Amtrak train ticket he bought to get back to St. Louis. FBI agents followed him onto that train, then onto a bus, and ultimately arrested him in Independence, Missouri, Friday. Police sources say he was carrying the gun they believe he used in the murders and was wearing shoes also connected to the killings. The deadly attack near a resort in Cancun, Mexico. Two were shot dead in a confrontation between rival gangs, sending tourists running from the beach to escape. This morning, cell phone videos capturing panic and chaos at this popular Mexico beach resort. Employees and guests rushing to cover as shots rang out on the beach nearby. Four American tourists were injured in the confrontation between rival gang members. One of those Americans in critical condition this morning hit by a stray bullet. I heard a whole bunch of popping noise and someone yelled out shooter. Hi, it's Zia Riviera, Cancun guests and hotel staff sheltering in place, some hiding in rooms and barricading the doors. Military personnel seen walking around the property. The Quintana Roo Attorney General's office says members of two rival gangs were engaged in a shootout. Two of them were killed. Armed suspects escaped on a stolen motorboat. So we know that that one American who was hit by a stray bullet is in the hospital this morning in critical condition. Three other Americans were also hurt. And this is just the latest in a string of incidents where tourists have been caught in the middle of warring gangs. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? Something is changing in our world. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. One of the many signs that we are living in the last days is that men would be lovers of themselves, as we read in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Every characteristic listed after men would be lovers of themselves illustrates what men do when they love themselves above God. When you jump down to verse 13, the Bible states, But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. It is very evident 
that evil is getting worse and deception is off the charts. Godlessness is now taking over all aspects of society. Unspeakable. That's the word one school official is using to describe the murder of a beloved high school teacher. Her body, with severe trauma to the head, was found hidden in a local park. And now two 16-year-old students have been charged as adults in her killing. It's a shocking killing. A beloved high school teacher found slain in a park. Now comes another shock. These two students charged with her slaying. 66-year-old Noema Graber taught Spanish at Fairfield High School in Iowa. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas noches. She was recently praised by a student during National Teacher Appreciation Week. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week, Mrs. Graber. Thank you for all that you do in and out of the classroom. Um, we really appreciate how much fun we have in your class and how much Spanish we learn. And uh, we just hope you have a really good day. Gracias. She was a classy lady. She was a dedicated lady. She cared deeply about the kids as people. The teacher was reported missing on Wednesday. Her body was found under a tarp in the park later that day. Police say the two accused boys knew that she took a stroll in the park every day and that they were waiting to ambush her. The cause of death is said to be a blow to her head. Chayden Miller and Jeremy Goodale are charged with first degree homicide. This photo shows Miller and his sisters reenacting the famous painting American Gothic. And this video shows a young Goodale during Christmas. Tons of fun. In a Facebook posting, the slain teacher's son says, I forgive them and feel sorry that they had that anger in their hearts. There's no point in being angry at them. My mother was an angel of a woman and was one of the kindest souls. Fairfield High School has 522 students. Mrs. Graber taught there for nine years. The school was closed today to allow staff and students to mourn. Nineteen-year-old Sarah Buckle was clubbing with her friends when something went terribly wrong. I started screaming and then throwing up and going unconscious and coming back round and it was just this horrible cycle. Her friends brought her to the hospital. When she woke up the next morning, she noticed a strange bruise on her hand. The bruise got bigger and it got darker. A scientist who works with the police um, had a look and said, well, that definitely looks like a needle prick, if that makes sense. Police forces across the country say they've received at least 56 reports of spiking involving needles in the last two months, and nearly 200 reports of drink spiking. Women being slipped something to drug them or incapacitate them when they're out at night, unfortunately, isn't unheard of, especially at the start of the school year. But spiking with needles are something new. Adding to the concern is the fact that not much is known about the scale of the problem. We have no good data on just how common this is. But what we do know is that most women who are taken advantage of while intoxicated with drugs and alcohol do not report it to the police. Oh, Boycotts of clubs and bars have taken place across the country as women here, like Sarah, demand change from club owners and police. There is so much which they must be doing. They must provide a medic on site. They can't have any CCTV blind spots. You feel unsafe? I feel really unsafe. Um, I think everyone feels really unsafe. Everybody knows it's an issue, and I think we're finally, we've just had enough. Enough of going out at night and being left in the dark. As Christ followers, what are we to do as we see the world growing darker? We are to walk in love, light, and wisdom, as we read in Ephesians 5, 1 through 21. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us, and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an adulterer, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. 
Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Brothers and sisters, put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10-18 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Luke 21-25 And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, one of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. We are learning more about a stunning assassination attempt against the Prime Minister of Iraq that could show the future of terrorism. Someone flew at least two armed drones into his home yesterday, but he escaped with only a small cut. Iraq security forces believe a militia backed by Iran is responsible. MTS Tayeb has been following this story. MTS, good morning. Nate, good morning. Yes, we have a very tense situation on the ground in Baghdad right now. Take a look at this. This is just outside the prime minister's residence where at least six members of his security detail were injured in that drone attack. Now, reports just coming in at this very moment suggest Iranian-made drones and explosives were used in this attack. And while no group has claimed responsibility, it comes at a time of deadly protests over the weekend following disputed elections, which saw parties aligned with Iranian-backed militias lose two-thirds of their seats in parliament. As far as we know, never has a drone been used to target the head of state of any country. And this strike sets an alarming precedent for a technology that has gone from being advanced weaponry in a military's arsenal to being commercially available. And the concern now is that this brazen assassination attempt will only trigger more violence. For more than a year, the devastating war in Ethiopia's Tigray region has consumed Africa's second most populous nation. Jeffrey Feltman, the U.S. special envoy to the Horn of Africa, has met with Ethiopia's prime minister to resolve the fighting. On Friday, the U.N. Security Council called for peace and for the access of humanitarian aid. Just about one million people live in famine-like conditions in the region as the fighting fuels the world's worst hunger crisis in a decade. Deborah Pada reports. We will bury this enemy with our blood and bones. It's hard to imagine these are the words of a Nobel Peace Prize winner. 
That's Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed marking one year since he sent his troops in to crush the rebellious Tigray region. Since then, his standing as a peacemaker who won the Nobel Prize for ending the war with Eritrea has been undermined. Abiy's troops, together with Eritrean soldiers, are accused of committing unspeakable atrocities. Massacres, gang rape and ethnic cleansing. The United Nations calls them war crimes and stresses. They have been committed on both sides of the conflict. They kill us, they kill us. Not we, we kill them, they kill us. And at the center of it all, innocent civilians staring down a deepening humanitarian crisis. Over 900,000 people at risk of starvation, hunger used as a weapon of war as food aid convoys have been blocked. The immediate trigger for the military conflict was Tigray's decision to hold an unauthorized poll in 2020 after Abiy postponed the country's elections. And in November last year, he sent the Ethiopian military into Tigray, claiming he was responding to an attack on a government military camp. Since then, the fighting has seen devastating casualties with as many as several hundred thousand dead. Now there are fears that the Tigrayan soldiers could advance on Addis Ababa after they captured two cities near the capital and joined forces with eight other anti-government factions. The U.S. Embassy in Ethiopia has warned its citizens to leave the country without delay. Koti Sangi is one of the busiest food markets in western Kabul. The produce comes fresh from farms outside the city. Prices are cheap. For three years, Riazullah has been here with his wheelbarrow. He's a Karachi one, men who for a small fee transport shoppers groceries. Yet for the last few months, his wheelbarrow has been mostly empty. He says shoppers can't afford his services. There is no business, he tells this man. We just roam around. He approaches women, hopeful they may need help. <laughs> Auntie, do you need a wheelbarrow, he asks. But they walk away or ignore him. He is five hours into his work day and has earned only 20 cents. He used to earn about $3 a day, enough to pay his rent and feed his family. Frustrated, he heads home. He spends his day surrounded by food, but ever more frequently returns to his family empty-handed. Afghanistan's economy is collapsing. Under the last government, 75% of public expenditure came from foreign grants. U.S. and U.N. sanctions meant that evaporated upon the Taliban's takeover. Taliban officials say they need sanctions lifted and aid agencies to return to tackle the problem. With little money to go around, banks limit withdrawals, employers can't pay their staff, and Riazula and his family are paying the price. Today they had green tea for breakfast, lunch is dal and bread, they will ration the leftovers for dinner. I used to bring a lot of food to the house before the Taliban, but now there is no work and it is pushing me into even more of a crisis. I'm due to pay $22 for rent, but I still owe for last month and the children's health is getting weaker day by day. They are not alone. 95% of people in Afghanistan are not consuming enough food and more than half, about 22 million people, are malnourished, some so severely they may not make it through the winter. This is what Riazullah is trying to avoid. Al Jazeera has visited multiple hospitals in recent months, the ward swelling with more children being treated for malnutrition. Aid agencies say it's the worst food crisis in Afghanistan since records began. They say children are already starving to death. We are looking at five million children who are one step away from starving to death. So that's serious. Um, five million children are going hungry, they do not have food, they are surviving on bread and uh, uh, the, the diet that really they are getting is not, is not enough to sustain them. Riazula doesn't know what to do. He says the pressure is immense. The days are getting shorter and he wonders if he and his wheelbarrow will bring home just enough for his young family to last the winter. Psalm 18.7 Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of the hills also quaked and were shaken, because he was angry. It looks like something out of a post-apocalyptic sci-fi movie. 
well-appointed homes and luxury dwellings buried under feet of ash. Deck chairs, children's swings, they're vestiges of everyday life on the island of La Palma. Life on La Palma, which is part of Spain's Canary Islands, has been interrupted since September, when a volcano known as La Cumbre Vieja started erupting. The volcano has destroyed thousands of homes and caused thousands of people to evacuate. Volcanologists don't know when La Cumbre Vieja will stop erupting. Meanwhile, it continues to make the familiar strange. What was once a street is now a wall of lava. What was once a mountain slope is now a landing ground for lava bombs. And what were once homes are now buried under feet and feet of ash and lava, possibly forever. There has been a dramatic increase in volcanic eruptions around the world, and nobody knows why. You probably haven't noticed because nobody seems to be talking about it, but something is going on with the world. Volcanoes are erupting at a faster pace than ever, and earthquakes are going crazy, and nobody has an explanation for it. Nobody except God, that is. The seven-year tribulation is fast approaching this world, and the news headlines prove it. God in His grace and mercy is trying to shake the world out of its complacency. We are currently living in a time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. Jesus is likening last day's events to a woman in labor. The closer we get to Jesus' second coming, last day signs and calamities will become more frequent and more intense. Following the rapture of all true Christians to heaven, the Bible warns us that the wrath of God will be poured out on an unrepentant world. One of the judgments described in the book of Revelation seems to include a massive volcanic eruption, as we read in Revelation 8.8. Then the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Torrential rain and severe weather has caused widespread flooding across several parts of Bosnia-Herzegovina, burying cars, houses, and damaging roads and facilities. The country is no stranger to floods and landslides, but people say the sheer amount of rain that's fallen in the past 48 hours has been unexpected. All of a sudden, the rain started falling, and within 10 minutes, cars were covered by water, and all of this debris came in. In the towns of Konitz and Nyablanitsa, south of the capital Sarajevo, heavy machinery was brought in to clear the streets. But many roads will still need to be repaired before they can be used again. Emergency services have been deployed across this municipality as well as other areas of the country. People and machines are working hard to repair the damage. This is only one of the many affected locations. Along the Neretva River, a popular tourist location, restaurants and businesses have also been hit hard. Despite having a robust drainage system built to weather storms, the amount of water proved too much. The entire drainage system has been clogged up. We could not clean it fast enough. What can you do? Thankfully, no one was hurt and thank God it's only material damage that can hopefully be repaired. The local mayor, who was on-site monitoring the situation, told Al Jazeera that by Friday afternoon, some 60 truckloads of debris had been removed. But several towns in the area remained cut off, with roads leading in and out of them unusable. The amount of rain that's fallen in the last 36 hours equals the amount that usually falls during an entire month. Many businesses at homes have been damaged, but it's too early to assess the full extent. On a national level, the government has stopped short of announcing a state of emergency, but says the situation is serious. People here are taking it upon themselves to fortify their homes, stacking sandbags and other objects to fend off against the floods. Whilst the most severe damage caused by the floods has been outside of Sarajevo, here in the capital, the rainfall has been consistent, raising river levels and, as a result, fears that unless the weather improves, part of the city too could be flooded. Miami is set to become the most vulnerable coastal city in the world, according to the economic organization Resources for the Future, and it's not hard to see why. The city faces a constant barrage of storm surges, coastal flooding, and rising sea levels that, if not addressed, threaten its future. If we get a coastal surge from a storm or even a high tide, it can flood this area. Their challenges that Miami's chief resilience officer works on every day. Dozens of projects have already been completed, but the challenges are huge. It's an evolution. 
in the way we occupy this land and how we deal with the water, making room for water that you know we didn't think was going to be up on the land. I think we'll be here. I just don't think we'll look the same. That's a hard pill to swallow in a city that's expanding and known as the gateway to the Americas. But there are glimmers of hope. For decades, Miami's been considered the city at the forefront of tackling rising sea levels. And there's no question it is vulnerable. But many people point to this building, the Perez Art Museum of Miami, as a picture of what the future might look like. Sitting over three meters higher than current storm surge requirements, the museum incorporates the latest in porous materials, water management techniques and drainage. OK, well, this is fun. Let's do more of it. Despite the cost of construction at well over $100 million, it's an example of what can be done. We knew exactly where this building was going to be. We wanted to make sure it was here forever. And it starts right there. What are the needs of an art museum? But what are the needs when you are on the water in Miami, Florida? Like many coastal cities, Miami city planners are finally taking action some architects envisioning a very different relationship with the rising seas. Designs like this may be revolutionary, but experts say the alternative is unthinkable. We have an opportunity, hopefully, to innovate and to think of ways that we could live with water and, and still not have to pack and go, right? Because, you know, displacing six million people, you know, in an urban area is no easy task. The challenges and the costs involved are monumental. As sea levels continue to rise, the city could soon run out of options. Do not be deceived. The sin of humanity has cursed this world. Putting your trust in raising street levels, installing sea walls and pumps will not save you from the wrath of God. Only faith in Jesus Christ and the blood he shed on the cross can. Satan wants to seduce humanity into thinking they can save themselves all based on their own ingenuity and strength. Also, the devil can bring them into rebellion against God and ensure damnation for as many people as possible. This corrupted world is going to end, and everything with it, as we read in 2 Peter 3, 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Believers in Jesus Christ will not only live to see a new earth, they will receive a new, perfect, incorruptible body as well. It just takes faith in him as the Savior who died for your sins to receive eternal life forgiveness, and one day an eternal body as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 51-55 Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal is put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Verse 51 tells us we shall not all sleep, meaning we shall not all die. There's going to be a whole generation of believers who are going to do an end run on the grave. We'll be caught up in the twinkling of an eye. We will receive immediately an immortal, imperishable, incorruptible body. We'll be caught up to be with the Lord. At the same time, those who've died, who are dead in the Lord, their bodies will be raised, and the Lord will bring their perfected spirits with him, and they'll be reunited, and their bodies will be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15-18 For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, should be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear, that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world, as we know it, is near. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, 
that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. When a person comes to know Jesus as their Savior, they are brought into a relationship with God that guarantees their salvation as eternally secure. To be clear, salvation is more than saying a prayer or making a decision for Christ. Salvation is a sovereign act of God whereby an unregenerate sinner is washed, renewed, and born again by the Holy Spirit, as we read in John 3.3 and Titus 3.5. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. When salvation occurs, God gives the forgiven sinner a new heart and puts a new spirit within him, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The Spirit will cause the saved person to walk in obedience to God's word, as we read in Ezekiel 36, 27 and James 2, 26. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So what about repentance? Repentance is not a work we do to earn salvation. No one can repent and come to God unless God draws that person to himself, as we read in John 6:44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Repentance is something God gives it is only possible because of His grace. All of salvation, including repentance and faith, is a result of God drawing us, opening our eyes, and changing our hearts. God's long-suffering leads us to repentance, and so does His kindness, as we read in 2 Peter 3.9 and Romans 2.4. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 declares, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works are not the cause of salvation. Works are the evidence of salvation. Faith in Christ always results in good works. The person who claims to be a Christian but lives in willful disobedience to Christ, has a false or dead faith, and is not saved. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. That is why John the Baptist called people to produce fruit in keeping with repentance, as we read in Matthew 3.8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. A person who has truly repented of his sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of a changed life, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. A person who has not repented of their sin and exercised faith in Christ will give evidence of the works of the flesh, as we read in Galatians 5:19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. A person who has crucified the flesh and belongs to Christ will give evidence of the Spirit, as we read in Galatians 5.22-24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, 
self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Believers are born again, regenerated when they believe. For a Christian to lose his salvation, he would have to be unregenerated. The Bible gives no evidence that the new birth can be taken away. The Holy Spirit indwells all believers, as we read in John 14, 17. The Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees Him or knows Him, but you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit baptizes all believers into the body of Christ, as we read in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For a believer to become unsaved, he would have to be unindwelt and detached from the body of Christ. John 3.15 states that whoever believes in Jesus Christ will have eternal life. If you believe in Christ today and have eternal life, but lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal at all. Hence, if you lose your salvation, the promises of eternal life in the Bible would be in error. Scripture says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Remember, the same God who saved you is the same God who will keep you. Once we are saved, we are always saved. Praise God. Our salvation is most definitely, eternally secure. Time is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. Occurs on a Sunday morning. My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! Uh -huh.